Now, we come to the sacrament of matrimony. And the fundamental question that comes up in regard to the church's understanding of the sacrament of marriage, and that is particularly the indissolubility of marriage, that is the bond of holy matrimony, when God has joined together, let no man put asunder, right? That that bond of matrimony, that covenant, is, ever, is not everlasting, but is permanent until death of one of the spouses. The church is teaching on the indissolubility of marriage. Amen? In light of that backdrop of the church's teaching, many will ask, both Catholic and non-Catholic as well, so I'm speaking to both communities here, why doesn't the Catholic Church allow for divorce and remarriage? And I'm going to emphasize the remarriage point. In the case of spousal infidelity, such as Jesus teaches, or seems to teach, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Do I have 9 on your handout? Did I get it right? Okay. I have 19 or 19, 9? 19, 19, 9. Oh, okay. Uh, You're really got <laughs> <laughs> Delete the 19, okay? It's Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, all right? It's verse 9. This was one mistake, Mike, I caught before coming here. <laughs> but I didn't catch it on the handout. I caught it in my notes. I accidentally had put a 1 in front of the 9. So anyway, so why doesn't the Catholic Church allow for divorce and remarriage in the case of spousal infidelity when Jesus seems to teach in Matthew 19, 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another, commits adultery. In other words, Jesus is saying, if Jack divorces Will, see, oh man, I messed that one up big time, huh? <laughs> Woo! If Jack divorces Jill, and their husband and wife in this case, not brother and sister, if Jack divorces Jill and marries Betty Sue, right? That's not going to be an adultery, okay, if it's this exceptional case of unchastity. So if Jack puts away Jill, marries another, he's not going to commit adultery if it's unchastity, right? To state it differently, he puts away Jill, marries Betty Sue, he's going to commit adultery except for that case, to, uh, that case of unchastity. Y'all get, the, y'all get it, the logic, okay. So the question is, is Jesus here, when he says, except for the case of unchastity, this exceptional clause, right? Is Jesus referring to spousal infidelity? I'm going to suggest to you, no. That he is not allowing spousal infidelity to be a reason for remarriage. Now, does the church allow for divorce and civil divorce? In the cases, in certain circumstances, maybe spousal infidelity or if the well-being of the wife or the husband in some cases is in threat, does the church allow for divorce? Yes. Physical separation, amen? And even get the bill of divorce from the state, i.e. civil divorce. But what the church does not allow for is for the quote-unquote remarriage. But some will say, well, Jesus seems to say here that spousal infidelity would be a case for a remarriage. Is that what he's referring to? Well, I suggest no, as the Catholic Church has suggested for the past 2,000 years. And here are the reasons why. So we need to clarify this misinterpretation of Matthew 19.9. First reason, Jesus responds in the negative to the Pharisees' question. The Pharisees come up to Christ within the context and said, Jesus, Moses permitted a bill of divorce. What do you say about it? Amen? Now, let's establish a little background knowledge. I want to get you in the mind of the Pharisees. According to the Jewish understanding, in light of the Pharisees' understanding of the law, spousal infidelity was a sufficient reason for not only divorce, but for remarriage. In fact, that was one of the only reasons. They were a bit more strict than the Sadducees. The Sadducees were a little bit looser, and as some people like to joke, <laughs> you know, if your wife doesn't cook you breakfast good enough, you can get rid of her type of thing, you know? But, but they, in order to communicate that they were looser, there was many reasons within the Sadducees' tradition that a man could put away his wife, divorce her, and marry another. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were a bit more stricter. However, they allowed for spousal infidelity to be a reason for the dissolution of marriage and 
remarriage. That's how they understood divorce. That's how they understood the Mosaic precept of divorce. You divorce and you remarry. Amen? That's the mentality of the Pharisees to which Jesus is responding. So the Pharisees, who already believe spousal infidelity to be a reason for divorce and remarriage, come to Jesus and say, what do you say, Jesus? And Jesus says, in the beginning, it was not so. Jesus establishes his teaching about marriage and the indissolubility of marriage in conscious antithesis to the Pharisees' understanding of divorce and remarriage. That is, he sets up his teaching, his law, in direct contradiction to what their thinking, to what their understanding of divorce and remarriage is. Jesus is appealing to the beginning, folks, before the Mosaic law, which was a concessionary law. The book of Deuteronomy as, oh, what prophet is it? Oh, it's slipping my mind. There's a prophecy that refers to the Deuteronomic law that not being good statutes, but statutes that only lead to death. The Deuteronomic code, folks, was a concessionary law in biblical history that was given because of the sins of the Israelites. In fact, I just learned today, I was listening to a lecture, the tablets that the Deuteronomic law, in which is found the precept for divorce and remarriage, was actually placed on the outside of the Ark of the Covenant to serve to be a witness against the Israelites for their sin. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Can't remember the verse. But note how the Deuteronomic law was on the outside of the covenant. What was inside the Ark of the Covenant? The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. So the Deuteronomic Code were concessionary laws. These weren't good laws to begin with. They were given to concede to the illness, so to speak, the immorality of the Israelites because things were really bad in the wilderness. All right. So Jesus sets up his teaching in conscious antithesis to that Pharisaic mentality. This is why we know Jesus is not permitting spousal infidelity to be a reason for the dissolution and remarriage. Because the Pharisees already believe that. And Jesus is saying no to that understanding. The second reason why I would suggest to you that Jesus is not teaching spousal infidelity as an exceptional case for remarriage. And that is the apostles' response to Jesus' teaching. And verse 9, let's see, in verse... I think it's verse 9, right at the end of verse 9, or it might be verse 10. Yeah, verse 10. If the case of a man with his wife be so, it is not expedient to marry. So Jesus gives this teaching. If a man puts away his wife, marries another, is committing adultery, except for this case of unchastity. The apostles immediately respond and say, this is a horror teaching, in other words. If this is so, who should get married? In other words... Now think about this. This is coming from the apostles who were Jews. Who already believed spousal infidelity to be a reason for divorce and remarriage. If that, was, if that is what Jesus was teaching in Matthew 19, 9, well why would the apostles respond in dismay? You see? So their response to Jesus' teaching leads us to conclude Jesus is not allowing for spousal infidelity to be a reason for divorce and remarriage, folks. Now, the question now is, okay, well, what is Jesus referring to in this exceptional case, right? If he says Jack puts away Jill, marries Betty Sue, he's committing adultery, except for this case of unchastity. Well, the Greek word there is porneia. Very important to establish this Greek word porneia and understand what's going on here. I would suggest to you that the exceptional clause that Jesus was referring to, this exceptional case, right, is the case of an unlawful union. How so? Well, in the Christian tradition, porneia is actually used by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, it's used to describe the immorality between a son sleeping or having intercourse with his father's wife. <laughs> okay? It's used in reference to incestuous relationship. So it's used to describe a union that is not lawful. We also see it used in the Christian tradition 
In Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem. Remember St. James rises up after Peter gives his declaration about how a man is saved by faith, not circumcision. Peter, uh, excuse me, James ri rises up and gives a pastoral plan in order to impose upon the newly Gentile converts. And there are four precepts of the pastoral plan. Number one, abstain from blood. Number two, abstain from meats not fully strangled from the blood. Number three, abstain from meats offered to idols. And number four, abstain from porneia. Right? Now, three of the four, the first three, meat, blood, and meat not strangled from blood, all three come from the Levitical law. Leviticus chapter 17. So it makes reasonable sense that the fourth precept would come from the Jewish tradition as well. Well, what Jewish tradition, what sort of immorality is found within the Levitical law? Incestuous relationships. Leviticus chapter 18, right after the, the blood prohibition and the meat offered to idols prohibition, right after that comes the, the precepts about in, unlawful unions. Incestuous relationships going down the line. So in the Christian tradition, whenever porneia is used... It seems to indicate unions that are not lawful. Primarily, and within a certain context, like incestuous relationships. Because this is what the Gentiles would practice. And when the newly Gentile converts would come into Christianity, not only the incestuous relationships, but all of the different wives that they had, right? When they would become Christian, they had to say no to those unlawful unions. This is what the early church was dealing with with the Gentiles. So it makes sense that the Greek word porneia within the Christian tradition is used in reference to some sort of union, sexual intercourse, that is not lawful. So it's in light of that background, folks, that we come to Jesus' words. And Jesus says, just to use the names here to flesh it out, if Jack puts away Jill and marries Betty Sue, Jack's going to be committing adultery with Betty Sue. Except for this case of porneia. Except for an unlawful union. That is to say, if the union between Jack and Jill was not lawful to begin with, then if Jack goes and marries Betty Sue, is he committing adultery? No. Why? Because his first union was porneia. Unlawful. Now, if it was lawful, why would Jack be committing adultery with Betty Sue? Because if it was lawful, guess what? The bond is until death. And consequently, Jack would be bound to Jill until death if it is lawful, if the union is there. And so if he would go and marry Betty Sue, he would be committing adultery. Now, interestingly enough, Remember how I stated how this porneia seems to be connected with this Jewish tradition of unlawful unions? This is even affirmed by the fact that Matthew, who writes only to Jews, is the only one who records the exceptional case of porneia. Mark does not. In Mark chapter 10, I think right around verses 10 through 12, Mark doesn't include the exceptional case. He just simply records Jesus saying, if a man puts away his wife, marries another, commits adultery. If a man marries a divorced wife, he commits adultery. No exceptional case. But Matthew puts it in. Why? I would suggest to you because it's, it's an understanding that comes from the Jewish tradition. And the Jews to whom Matthew is writing would understand the tradition about unlawful unions. And how in such unlawful unions, the man and the woman is not bound in the covenant of marriage. Amen? So... The exceptional case of the porneia refers to an unlawful union, which serves to be the biblical basis for the Catholic understanding of what? Annulments. Which according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1629, when it is in referencing the declaration of nullity, which we commonly, in popular language, refer to an annulment, the declaration of nullity, it says this, quote, i.e., the marriage never existed, end quote. That is to say, when the declaration of nullity is given, quote, unquote, an annulment, it is the declaration, the statement, that it was an unlawful union to begin with. That is, in the eyes of God. 
that the bond of husband and wife never existed in the first place. Consequently, Jack is free to what? Not remarry. Marry. That's right. That's right. Because he was never married to begin with. Yeah. Okay. So, what we see here. Now, remarry would be an appropriate term if your spouse would die, right? And then you get married again, which is legitimate because the spouse died and the covenant is dissolved, right? That bond is dissolved. So this is a very important topic for us to try to understand. I know it's kind of, it's kind of hard to grasp at first glance, uh, but that's why you buy the CDs, <laughs> okay? I have a CD set there on the sacramentality of marriage, on marriage. Uh, the sacrament of marriage ridding the plague of confusion. And I have a whole 80-minute lecture on the indissolubility of marriage. And I go into other biblical texts from St. Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which supports this interpretation of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 19. <laughs> 